How did you get into the industry? What courses and what connection did you need to get a job at Bioware? I think it was like an art class when I was about 13. And um, I started drawing pretty well. Compared to the rest of the class, I was fairly, uh, fairly accomplished. And that was really the first time that that kind of kicked off. And that was the first subject at school that um, I had any kind of flair for. Mm -hmm. Um, everything else was kind of like a bit of a ball and chain that I had to do, but visual arts was something that I kind of needed to do. Yeah. So it was just a case of cruise through every subject sufficient that I didn't have to re retake the exam. So that meant basically a flat C grade in everything except for visual arts. And I got A's in art going through high school. And then... Uh, in Britain, you have to do like an access course to get into university to study art. You've got to mm -hmm. do this foundation course thing. So I did that, and then I got onto my bachelor's. wasn't very well suited, but it was uh, digital art. Mm -hmm. um, and at this point, video games were kind of pretty much on the horizon. It was like a dream before, and it was unattainable. And video games just kind of drop out of volcanoes, and they they land on the shelves, and that's where video games come from. And they cost forty five pounds for some. Reason. So I did this digital art degree. Um, didn't do particularly well because it was like one of the first years that was run and I didn't really have any enthusiasm for um, the material that we had to do it was all websites and PowerPoint presentations and um, you know interactivity it was you know pretty basic stuff it wasn't very juicy at least I didn't find it very juicy I didn't have a particular mind for it the portfolio that I had then no games companies would touch me and no yeah. graphic companies would touch me either so I took a year and I did lots of independent study and some freelance design and illustration work and a little bit of photography. My mum spotted an advert for this new master's course that was uh, advertising for students and she thought, do you know what, this could be the best thing that you've ever done. So I pitched my portfolio to the, uh, to the MA and um, yep, got onto the MA with a full scholarship. and. Nice. Uh, and did that for, I think it was a 50 week course. And it was like 50, 40 now, uh, 50, 90 hour weeks. It was pretty, oh. pretty hardcore. Oh my God. It was, a, it was a two year course folded into a single year. So Ooh. it was like, do this, then do that. Do this, do this. But you are and now I, doing what you wanted to do. Exactly, exactly. And beyond the vocational side and the technical side, the course leader at the time, a guy called Simon Redmond, was so critical. I mean, I don't think he was the kind of burnt out, jaded developer that had done, um, that had gone into education as a, you know, because he didn't want to uh. spend any time in the industry anymore. It was more a case of, I've had my taste of the industry and I've worked with people who are kind of, they are of a, a particular opinion about how this industry should work. Mm -hmm. And I want to encourage something different. So he did the he did this course for I think five years, four four or five years. And his he had a mantra, and it was excellent, absolutely excellent. It was all about uniqueness of visuals. Um, really try to innovate with whatever aspect of the game that you're working on, whether it's audio design or nice. visual. So this guy was very pro keeping the budgets realistic in your mind and. Making sure that everything stayed realistic in your mind, you know what I mean? Yeah. That's useful that he didn't just teach you the art, but he also taught you, like, how to actually get into the, into the, the that, that position, like, you know, how to think going into it. Exactly. Exactly. And I think it's a shame that course doesn't, isn't running anymore because um, it was, it was great. I mean, yeah. it was a great course. At the end of the Masters, um... Uh, a lot of us organized an exhibition and then um, yeah Sony art director turned up and picked three of us and said we want to have a little chat so I'd been at Sony for about a year and um, working on Formula One and Neil Thompson had worked for Cygnosis some years before and he'd gone off to do another company I think he was uh, he'd started a company with a load of mates called Curly Monsters and they did something for a few years, and then um, he ended up coming back with a few of them to Liverpool. 
and uh, he came back as the lead artist on that year's Formula One. I think it was Formula 105 was the one he led. Yeah, we got uh, fairly matey fairly soon, played a lot of darts together. He left, I think, about five or six years after that, mm -hmm. went to another Liverpool company, um, and he was always very keen to uh, get me to follow him. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, he moved over here eventually. And I was always able to say that I was comfortable at Sony and that my, my career was doing well. And then all of a sudden I was able to take him up on the offer and get my portfolio in line. Nice. And that was nearly exactly three years ago. Three years ago, I would have been working on my portfolio. Having decided to get into the career, was there ever a time where you questioned whether it was worth it or not? I mean, it's never smooth, and it's, it's particularly coming up through the UK games industry. I mean, there was a period about three or four years before I came to Bioware where it felt like there was a company closing every fortnight. Yeah. To start something new at that scale, to do AAA stuff, it's very tough. Um, it's a conversation I was having with an old mate a couple of, uh, couple of days ago. Mm -hmm. Where has that middle space gone? You know, there's either indie or there's God tier. And mm. um, between that, you you kind of have to start thinking about introducing a new price point, which is right in the middle. You know, the kind of twenty to thirty dollar range, where it's not quite an indie. It's got better production quality and longer duration for the game than an indie, but it's not quite top tier. When you're working away, wondering whether the next call will claim your career. You do tend to wonder, you know, why don't I do graphic design where there's a different project every week yeah. and pretty much always someone somewhere will need something providing that I can do. Other things creep in, you know, life happens in between all of the other stuff and usually, traditionally, games companies are populated by human beings and every, everyone experiences life differently. Fortunately, I've survived so far. Um, and my career has been pretty good to me. So, um, if I, uh, yeah, if my morale takes a dip, I know that the routine of work is going to be a good rescuing, yeah. rescuing force for me. So uh, I've got faith in the career, and so far the career has got some faith in what I can do. What was the first game you worked on? The first game I was working on was a kind of it was a concept project that I think was shelved. The project was cancelled about four months after I started on it. I was kind of concept artist on that, but after that started the uh, the Formula One chapter. Um, so that was the first game that I was credited on, mm -hmm. Formula One for. And I did the promotional stuff and the box art. And, well, two of us did the box art and the promotional stuff. Really? I worked with one of the senior artists. Um, cool. Who also survived when that project was cancelled. Andy, he and I did the, all of the box art and the promotional stuff. And the, awesome. uh, the compositing and stuff. So... Yeah, it was good. Making was actually, box art's got to be fun. Well, this is the thing I was just about to say. It's it's a kind of like a dream start because, yeah. you know, walking through Liverpool and HMV's right there and their window's full of the stuff that you were working on a month ago. It was really, really excellent. That's cool. And it was like there was no one there, no, no one I could have kind of called with the exception of my parents who would have seen any benefit in me having actually done the artwork. So... Uh, just next to me I've got a stack of those posters which I stole and I've got <laughs> loads of the other point of sale materials and it's like a token bit of proof that I actually worked on something <laughs> and like there are some mine. yeah well the, there are some little in jokes in the artwork that nobody noticed and uh, oh really yeah like, uh, <laughs> there's, there's marshals along the track and you can see their faces and we put the studio manager's face onto the, uh, the marshals Oh my god. Uh, none of the cars on the cover have got any drivers. They're all completely driverless. <laughs> <laughs> and that was just oversight. That's just because I rented them empty. I didn't put any crash helmets in them. Oh, mm, this is a good one. For Dragon Age Inquisition, who is your favorite companion right now and why? I kind of have to say Varric. Mm -hmm. That's a yeah. good one. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan. Um, Sarah's really good fun as well. Plus, doing the um, I worked for a little bit on the eyeball shader. Uh -huh. and, um, it just happened to be her head that I was testing all of the artwork on. 
And uh, yeah, I got to stare into Sarah's eyes for about two weeks. Um, so sweet. Isn't it though? <laughs> um, and uh, she was one of the test cases for getting the skin right as well. Really? And that was, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, so she's special. Yeah. You're like, yes. <laughs> she's also hilarious as well. Uh, so I've heard, and that she's got a great laugh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what race is your favorite and will most likely play as? So I'm going to probably play a few. I'm playing currently, my current playthrough is um, Human Warrior, mm -hmm. Two-Hander. And um, um, I, yeah, I like that. I like the power. Yeah. But there are, other, there are other, you know, there are other options. Um, so yeah, I'm looking forward to doing loads of different ones. What would you say if a company came up to you and said, Nick, we have a fantasy, sci-fi, and a steampunk. Which one do you want to work on? Um, I think, ask me 10 years ago, probably the uh, science fiction one. Um, because it was, you know, in that period of my life or that period of my career, that was the kind of cool thing that people wanted to work on because, you know. But um, as I've said before, it's like, there is a, a fairly massive separation between developing and playing for me now, yeah. and I'd probably just go for the go to the project that needed me most. Mm -hmm. um, not that I have, I don't think for a second that I have kind of an overinflated sense of purpose or influence, but um, you've got to be pragmatic because development's a business, and you've got to, you know, um, you've got to kind of like fill up fill up a team with people that can get it done in a certain time and yeah. I think what I, you know, on Dragon Age, what I think I've been able to contribute, I like to think it's help um, and I like to think that it is something because of my input that maybe it might not have been, it might, you know, run a frame quicker or it might look a bit prettier in certain areas or have a particular look but um, yeah. I probably, you know, even 10 years ago, I probably wouldn't have picked a steampunk game anyway. It was yeah. very much, uh, you know, it was the go-to solution for people looking to do something unique. And as such, nothing was unique, you know. Yeah. It's the incredible thing. It's like when everyone's special, no one is. Yeah, I'd go for the, uh, I'd go for the development experience where I felt useful. That, that makes sense. Because, okay. I mean, I like, I love steampunk, but I think the appeal lies more that it, it, it's it's in that it's not an extreme. It's kind of like in the middle. It has this sense of like past, but you've got these crazy this crazy tech involved it, there that's just like yeah. ah, it's so cool. It's don't get me wrong, it's a strong it, it's it's potentially visually strong. I mean, I know um one of my uh, one of my old friends from Sony, he makes steampunk props and weaponry. And they're gorgeous things. It's all made with proper, you know, brass fittings and glass and liquids and fluids. And it oh, looks nice. like props. They look, you know, they look heavy and they're, they're beautiful things. Um, so there's definitely, I have no doubt there's definitely a place for it. Yeah. Um, the order kind of looks like it might dribble over into the yeah, steam. Yeah, it does. Um, but that's kind of like, um, you know, exaggerated, uh, not exaggerated, um, eccentric facial hair and stunt by pats, and it's all very kind of Brunelian um, in its time period. But then, as you say, you've got that kind of crazy tech going on as well. Um, and there is this like cyberpunk, which has kind of come out of it. Yeah. That or was maybe more towards a... like robots and um, <laughs> uh, whatchamacallit, uh, augmentations. Yeah, definitely. So, uh, that's cool too. Yeah. Um, but again, it doesn't really kind of fire my spirit like um, science fiction used to. Yeah. Um, I think at this stage in my career, when it's easy to kind of become complacent, being useful and learning feeds my spirit an awful lot more than simply choosing a, an art style that I might like. What aspect of the Dragon Age Inquisition environment are you most proud to say you created or helped create? I'm pretty pleased with the cave stuff because it satisfied the brief and I think it's fairly unique and um, believable. Um, I mean, the inspiration from that was taken from real world 
cave structures. Nice. Um, uh, and as I said earlier, it was very much features. Say like you needed to do a junction between two caves for game, you know, for navigation, for gameplay or level layout purposes. I tried to find circumstances in nature where you would get that switch, where you would get two caves meeting and you would get a very, very natural meeting between them. So you'd have a pass through. And one of the ones that I've found, it was, um, it's, a, it's an event where two caves form. Mm -hmm. They get close, close enough for the wall to become very thin and then it can't support its own weight. So the very thin wall where the two tunnels meet collapses and you get a pass through from one cave into the next. Oh, nice. So I tried to achieve that, keep it looking believable and stuff. Um, the materials that those caves are made of, you know, some, again, the influence is taken from nature. So some of them are very dry looking. Some of them look like it's a very kind of lush, um, very wet environment. The shader that we have for um, the weather system when it's raining outside, um, that's a fairly sophisticated and reassuringly expensive shader. But, um, you know, when it looks good, it, it, it really sings. Um, and um, there's details there if people choose to look for them. And if they don't, hopefully it's all very subconscious and they absorb it organically, you know. But, um, yeah, that, that, the rain stuff was quite sophisticated. Nice. That's why you're proud of your rain. I am proud of the rain. Yeah, uh, you should be. Got any pet peeves regarding game graphics or visual effects? I don't think so. Really? Um... <laughs> Do I do I project a personality that is complaining about everything? <laughs> no, no, but pet peeves. Come on. I think um, there's cliches that prop up certain visual styles, and I, you know I kind of think that oh, you know they've kind of gone for uh, they've gone for obvious, <clears throat> where there was an opportunity to kind of forge ahead with something unique. Yeah, I don't have any peeves with visual effects. <clears throat> um, if the inconsistent and they can steer you the wrong way mm -hmm. then it becomes a problem if a visual effect is key to a game's design language there is a responsibility to be visually consistent every single time especially if you're trying to grab someone at the beginning of a game and maintain their attention right through till the end it's got to be finely balanced how challenging or different is working on dragon age inquisition compared to previous games you've worked on immeasurably bigger in pretty much every single capacity. I mean, working on things like Formula One, we worked on Formula One before the first night race, so we didn't have to take night lighting and darkness into account, so you can pretty much limit the lighting conditions down to a race to either <clears throat> bright sunlight or overcast and rainy. Yeah. And they're, they're fairly, you know, they're both fairly bright, so, um, so that is kind of covered. Wipeout, again, the lighting conditions are varied, but when you're kind of flying around at 400 miles an hour, 500 miles an hour, if you're looking at the lighting, you're probably missing the point of the game. Um, Motorstorm, similarly. <clears throat> there were varied lighting conditions, but you can tweak the lighting based on the levels or the track um, to better suit visibility. Mm -hmm. With things like DAI, there are instances where certain things have been done to fulfill certain purposes, like especially with things like dungeon crawls. Yeah. Um, there will be lighting conditions that you perhaps haven't planned for and you need to make sure that everything lights consistency, consistently and you don't lose the player. You still need to be able to com communicate the visual language and if they can't see, that becomes really, really difficult. Being constantly under the microscope is, is, I enjoy it, it's a good thing for me because it means that I'm refining the process. Yeah. Kind of gorge on critique, I need critique and I need feedback. Um, otherwise you don't learn anything, you don't grow. Yeah. Um, and I never pretend to have all of the answers, you know. Yeah. It's, it's not the done thing. Except when I've got all the answers. <laughs> Which is never. <laughs> <laughs> what was the hardest thing you've done in your entire career. Making Varric's chess hair glisten in the sun. Oh my God, I know. 
that wasn't me. So, <laughs> although I did make sure his chest hair was consistent with <laughs> with his facial hair. Leaving stuff behind and moving over to Bioware was a pretty huge gear change for me. Um, and I'm sure relocation. I mean, they say you know, moving house is one of the most stressful things you can do. Yeah. Uh, and for me, moving out here, leaving that life behind, and you know, taking a bit of a leap of faith, that was tough. Yeah. I think professional. Uh, that's a quite a personal. You know, th mm -hmm. that's on the personal side of difficulty associated with the job. Professionally, um, I was given the leadership of a team for Motorstorm Apocalypse. And having been an environment artist up until that point, the team, the nature of the work that the team was making was actually environmental animation and visual effects. And I was kind of picked for that in quite unfortunate circumstances, really, and, and it was very uncomfortable at the time. Um, the actual lead of that team, he, I think he broke his wrist snowboarding and he was out of the game for like six weeks. And um, in his absence, I'd done a load of stuff in an organizational capacity to test out the principles that this game, the game's chief kind of selling point would have been built around. And it was this notion that one particular circuit of a track was never the same as the next because buildings were crashing down and covering the routes or the road was kind of shearing and separating, mm -hmm. giving you different routes to the same finish. Um, and I, you know, put a load of stuff together and, um, and I was asked to carry on leading this team because of it. But I had zero experience of doing anything in an animation capacity or anything in a visual effects capacity. <clears throat> and the workflows were very alien and um, it was a different company as well. I would kind of started in Sony Studio Liverpool, and this was Evolution Studios, who had a very different development culture. Um, so I think that was that was um, that was incredibly difficult. That was a some, a bit of a low point, really, because mm -hmm. a lot of decisions were being made, and I was being told things that were flying clean over clean over my head, and oh, didn't know where to start. But then within about two months of taking that on, we started doing a vertical slice for that game, and that kind of forces you to really, you know, uh, sharpen yourself up. And um, it was a good opportunity to actually get workflow sorted for that project. So I maintained that that team performed brilliantly. I think in about 11 months, we did something like we, <laughs> they, did nearly 300 unique uh, environmental animations of different things happening. Uh, as I remember, I think we were the we were one of the only teams that were bug free at beta sub. It was a real, really satisfying technical achievement. Yeah. How invested are you in stuff like weather looking beautiful or real? I think it kind of has to look beautiful, anyway. Yeah. You know, the whole point of this thing is kind of well, not the whole point, but what people look for with video games, and I think just visual art more broadly, cinematic art, or even other, you know, non-visual art forms, music. People look for escapism. They look to be transported to somewhere yeah. that isn't here. And um, you've got to make it believable. So you've got to look to reality for your, uh, for your uh, lead. But you've also got to find the best that reality can give you. So yeah. it's got to kind of be noticed and appreciated, then completely dismissed, like um, visual effects in movies. If they've done it right, you never question it. Yeah. Um, if it's a visual effect, not even in a kind of sci-fi thing, if it's just subtle, you know, Boardwalk Empire is full of visual effects. So is Game of Thrones. Yeah. And the finest work that they do, I think, no one will ever spot because it's so beautifully done and it's yeah. integrated so slickly into the final shot. Um, Wait, you yeah. mean dragons aren't real? Well... I hate, to, I hate to break this too. Where do, you, where do you think we get our primary source reference from? See, okay, see, the, I thought that I knew they were real. Yeah, yeah. For the last question, what are your top five dream cars? Dream cars? Yeah. My own car is a bit of a dream car. 2013 Dodge Challenger RT. Oh my god. Um, I can't not say that. There's the. There's a car that came out a couple of years ago called the Lamborghini Sesto Elemento. 
that's oh, a pretty yeah. special that's a pretty special car yeah nodding along like <laughs> oh, oh my god that one's so cool the new tesla i think that's pretty amazing the toyota 2000 gt and it's not exactly a dream car but i think it's important because it was kind of like the first sports car for the everyman and that's the datsun 240z which i think is like 1973 1974 mine yours a honda civic <laughs> that's five yeah that's that's it right there five honda civics <laughs> <laughs> so that's pretty much it thank you so much nick for doing this it's been an absolute pleasure a lot of people were looking forward to this so you well, answered a lot of their questions and we appreciate it good good i'm glad again if you guys want to know all the, the 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 games that nick worked on it'll all be in the description for you to just check that out i had it on the other video but i'll put it in this video as well um so yeah, that's pretty much it. Thank you so much for watching. Nick, again, thank you so much. Had fun, Bless. as always. And I'll talk to you guys later.